I don't know how close we have to hold this thing, but like for the yeah. Okay, yeah, this one. <laughs> Welcome to Thank Olava you. Talks. We've just watched uh, two movies, short movies by Miguel Perez dos Santos. Uh, there's no images and voices. I cannot pronounce the. It's okay. Is there hard to no images. No images. Um, two very important works. About about a month ago, you sent me uh, the works, and I wasn't able to really watch them at once. Like I, I had to stop, and I like, go do something else and come back. Especially the second one, voices. <laughs> and um, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. But first, Olava talks. What is Olava talks? Um, this is the fourth I'm having. Uh, the first three were with Rashid Aziz, with Helen Christel, and Anusha Zume. Uh, Olava Talks is a concept that I'm trying and I'm working with a little bit. Um, it involves, it basically comes from the fact that in the last three years, four years, I've been doing a lot of anti-racism work, I've been in a lot of feminist spaces, a lot of queer safe spaces. Um, I've been, had the privilege of meeting people like uh, Miguel, and whether it's at demos, whether it's during you know, action groups, um, I find myself having these amazing conversations that sometimes feel like they're life-changing. And I get home and I'm like, I have no record of this. I have no record of this moment. And I have no record of this exchange that happened. And I feel like you can do all the feminist reading, which I, I'm slowly starting to do. And you can do all the, all the sociological research. You can do all the... But there's something, there's a power to the way that conversations um, generate knowledge, but also transfer knowledge. And I thought, wouldn't it be awesome to figure out a way to archive these moments? And I think... The Netherlands is having a quite an interesting moment in terms of activism, and in also queer activism and black activism. And I thought it's also really important to have an archive of this, and so we'll get back to that as well, which is really why I'm very excited to be here with, uh, with Miguel, because you're quite an archivist. And um, so that's the concept. That's the concept of the Olava Talks. Um, we're live streaming the first four. And uh, after that, we're going to a more, uh, more, uh, yeah, edited, more calmer, uh, no live stream, basically. <laughs> um, but okay, so this is the last live stream you're getting, and the next ones you'll be seeing as like you know nice vodcasts, which is a video podcast. Anyways, does that explain what the Olava talks are about? Yes, yes, good, good. Miguel is here today because I asked him whether he wanted to do an Olava talks with me and whether we could uh, screen uh, two of his works here at the Hassan Stockpartei Kampagne Pond. Um, what I think is really interesting about, about his work is it involves the kind of archiving, sort of like the curation of archives that um, I wonder the things that we produce right now in our day and age, how will it be transferred in the future? And I think as artists, as creators, as thinkers, it is such an important way, important way of engaging the future is this archives. But Miguel is showing us what do people do with the archives that are here for, with us. And um, I'm very excited because uh, uh, that's a theme that is really important to me. And um, I want to delve basically right into what we've just seen. Yeah. And what is really uh, interesting is the first piece, There Are No Images, is, is, is like low on images, but, um, but um, it's about images. It's about what archives can be, what memory can be, what, uh, uh, what, how transgenerational knowledge uh, uh, happens. So I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about the, 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 where does it come from? What's the genesis of There Are No Images? Could you talk to us about that? Of course. Okay. You have to hold this, I'm afraid. Yeah, I think. But you I think were so. in control. I'm not, no, <laughs> it's, a, it's a shared safe space. It's, okay. it's a shared it's space? A, yes, it's a shared space. <laughs> um, Shit, I'm never in control of anything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was doing a, a program in Brussels that actually uh, terminated uh, last year because of lack of funding. Mm -hmm. It was called Sound, Image and Culture. And I mean, I've been uh, dealing with so-called post-colonialism issues since 2011. Uh, but this uh, central uh, theme that you saw a little bit more dissect uh, in a film has been, of course, with me all my life. Okay. And, but I could never find a form for it until I got an assignment in that program where they asked me for an auto-ethnographic uh, piece. Okay. 
And actually, I had started with uh, the first segment that you hear of about six minutes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that. So I just recorded uh, live, of, uh, recorded in an improvisation performance-like way. Mm -hmm. And that had such an impact on me that I actually felt that I had to make a film out of it. Did you, did you know when you started, when you, because it's improv, pro, did you know it was going to lead you to this conversation with your dad? Was that something? From the beginning. Oh, that, you, you know, okay. Yeah, uh, something that may be important to know. Uh, my father fought in a war uh, against uh, Angola, in the Freedom War of Angola, mm -hmm. on the Portuguese side. And he was severely traumatized, mm -hmm. as many of his mm -hmm. generation. Actually, I think we lost a complete generation in Portugal. Mm -hmm. We are not really aware of it. And uh, so he would never talk about what happened there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say the weapons were shit and the food was awful mm -hmm. and there was a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. But really talking about what really happened and why he was so extremely violent. Mm -hmm. My father was physically and psychologically even more mm -hmm. an extremely violent person. And it was for me always trying to understand what, what what's in his mind. And I would ask him a lot, but he, um, he didn't give me any information. So, but to go back to your question, yeah. because I dwell every... Uh, um, so when, I'm, when I was doing this, I was kind of engaging in a dialogue because my father died in 2002, and I didn't have the chance to say goodbye, or, and our relationship was really deteriorating mm -hmm. uh, for already 20 years. So I had almost no contact with him. Mm -hmm. And this was a way of maybe a kind of... Uh, of psychological <laughs> psychotherapy mm -hmm. work um, linking it also with theory mm -hmm. so the, the, the what I like about this film is that it has a very strong autobiographical aspect but it also has a very strong content aspect yeah. of image yeah. uh, which I was uh, educated in mm -hmm. and that combination is I think uh, fruitful, hopefully, for the viewer, that he can not only reflect about my life, because it's not only about me, but about image, indeed, what you're saying, and how image uh, uh, constructs memory. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk a lot about uh, archives, indeed, and what is our history, mm -hmm. but our history is most of the time made. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of erasure, and there's a lot of making a narrative and we are not that well aware of that. Yeah. Many times we look at history as something that is impartial, yeah. but most of the time history is made. I thought that was a really interesting, when you, when in your piece, there is this, there is this, uh, this, uh, um, there is this, it, this sort of free thought process about what is the connection between memory mm -hmm. and, and images and reality, right? And the processes of an illusion as well, right? And the process of reconstructing um, what, what, what has happened, you know. And I think that's really interesting. The father, the father voice seems to say, like, um, seems to really be looking for, I don't know, like a pro like a sort of mental process of erasing everything that happened, it's like, and and actually doubt its very existence, right? And what I think is really interesting, you put that in terms of in terms of, of theory, indeed. I'm sorry, Olava, but mm -hmm. you you are aware that it's not my father, right? No, it's not. Oh, okay. I thought it was a conversation between you and your father. It would be beautiful. Okay. What what was it? What was that excerpt from? That was from a, a filmmaker, very well known okay. filmmaker from Portugal. Okay. Uh, Manuel Oliveira. Oh wow. Yeah. And uh, I stole it from a film uh, he made with Van Vender. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I took that piece and I took it because it just fit it perfect. perfectly. Yeah. I thought, yeah. well, that's not okay. I wish my father would talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> and what I think is really interesting, we're having a, an interesting conversation right now in the Netherlands yeah. about images yeah. and about the histories that we reconstruct. Yeah. You know, the statutes that we have. Are we having that talk, really? I, I, think, I think, I was watching like about two or three nights ago, I was watching this debate uh, the the Nederland Nederland debatteer so it's like it was this television show mm. that had to do with whether or not we should like rename the you know streets like uh, mm. uh, Jan Peter Koen's uh, Koen's zone and uh, Michiel de Ruiter and how, mm. what do we do with Maurits house what do we do yeah. with these images on the Koen's what do we do with Walter Piet yeah. and um, and I thought it was really interesting that you in, in your piece I was the, when I first watched it, I was like I think this is really about 
um, to me, it made me think like, how do we construct an image of a past, of a Dutch past, and and how much we erase the slaughter, the pain, the uh, the, the the murder, the carnage that we erase, and and how we basically in the streets create these images of heroes in movies, even in musicals, right? And um, and so I don't know if that was something that was for you, also something that played a role in what you're thinking about images and 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 and, and, and memory and constru reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Well, I can I can uh, I can tell you that uh, I was not thinking in that in this film mm -hmm. much more in the second. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the first film was uh, no, the, I don't think that I'm trying to do that. I'm I, I do try to reconstruct a memory mm. that probably is not there. So okay. it's a real strange paradox. Yeah. But to come back to your uh, point of having a discussion in a, in the Netherlands, yeah. I am quite um, how can I put this in a good way. I'm skeptic okay. about the discussion uh, because in my op opinion and if you look at the second fi film I, I think that I try to also to make an allusion to the now yeah. this talk has been for years so I don't think we're having a real talk yeah. I think we're going around stuff yeah. because these topics about Schwarte Piet about naming streets has been here for <laughs> And uh, there's a reason why they don't stay on on the place, and that reason is, in my op <laughs> in my uh, humble opinion, it's because there's no discussion. There's a dominant discourse overruling another discourse, mm -hmm. and that's not a discussion. Mm -hmm. That's an imposement of an idea upon another idea. Yeah. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have Star to Pete anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we wouldn't have those names anymore. Yeah. Because those those voices are there already for ages, yeah. but there's somebody not listening. Yeah. So I'm really careful with the word discussing because that's you used and appropriated by a lot of people by saying, "But now it's so much better. We are living. We are all together. It's all so nice, and we are talking about stuff. Yeah. We have been talking about stuff for ages, people. Yeah. <laughs> we, it's time to do something." Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm a little bit done with with dialogue. Yeah, I'm sorry. True. No, it, it's a, it's a, a little bit radical, maybe, by some. Not but here. I'm I'm a little bit done. Not here. Yeah. I think that's really important. What you say about like we've been having this conversation, and we keep you know like I was watching these images. Why one one of the points that I stopped in the second movie that yeah. I was like I had to leave is I was literally watching something that happened 70, 60, 70 years ago that I could recognize only a few yeah. years ago. I was in Chauda. At the at the intocht, for the class intocht, yeah. and the way the police was beating up Jerry, yeah. I, it was I was right yeah. there. Like, oh, you were there. I was right there. Yes, we were all arrested. Yeah. And and this sort of I could see like they were doing the 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 hekka, the, mm -hmm. the um, what they call it, the, what's the English word? These sort of these fences, and they're pushing us. In the movie, like you see these yeah. fences. With us, they had sort of we thought that they were there to protect us. Yeah. That the police had sort of cordoned us off mm -hmm. to protect us because there were a lot of like very like Nazi sort of mm -hmm. like fascist people like yelling doing Hitler uh, greetings and they were all around us in Gauda. And the police circled us and we thought, ah, they're coming to protect us, which made sense. We thought. But we we're all standing there quiet. We had already agreed no one is gonna shout anything, just having signs, we're just gonna sit there, stand there. Within like half an hour of standing there, the police starts moving us all in one block into a little alley and arrests all of us. Yeah. And right in front of me, I saw how they attacked Jerry. And I had to stop when I was watching this because I was like, we keep doing, this is still mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about how, and when I was watching, I was like, how these, these, your work sort of like confronts us, like this archival work, this curation of like this uncomfortable truths about what it means to be Dutch, what it means to be in the post-colonial Holland, um, and how this sort of things happen and then they're erased. Like the next day when we left the jail, no, no, eight hours after we left the jail, I walked out of the, they put us in these little vans, in these little jail vans, yeah. um, with each two of us. And I remember I walked out thinking, the whole country saw this. I thought we were gonna walk out and we're gonna see Telegraph, Ade, you know, uh, NRC, Volkskrant saying the police did the most ridiculous thing you can imagine. Mm -hmm. 
and they attack this man. And I have no Jerry. He's a very mm -hmm. soft-spoken man. And it's like, mm -hmm. it, he's like a puppy. <laughs> Every time I say I want to hug him. And, and for him, them to have exacted so much violence, it was incredible how much violence they yeah. exacted on him. Yeah. And I walked out thinking, people, like this was recorded. Yeah. What I saw online, what I saw on television yeah. was the complete opposite. Yeah. Somehow we were like, I don't know how they did it, but we looked like we were the agitators there. Mm -hmm. We looked like we were the ones that were aggressive towards children. And mm -hmm. I remember parents holding children and children crying, and these parents were yelling at us, mm -hmm. racial slurs, mm -hmm. children crying, and the camera footage on the newspaper, it looked like we were making those children cry. Yeah. Yeah. It was absolutely horrendous. Mm -hmm. And I was watching this the other day, and I was like, I can't, I, I gotta stop. I have to remember something that Abu Qasim al Jaberi said to me once. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we uh, it's about uh, this dialogue. He makes, he makes this metaphor, uh, which is very, I find it uh, precise, precisely good. So it's like um, um, you're standing on my foot, yeah. okay? and you're called Yom. Yeah. Okay? Now. And uh, I say to you, Yom, get out of. Of standing in my foot because it's doing pain. Yeah. And Yom says, Well, but I'm standing in my foot all the time and you never complain. Why the fuck are you complaining? About? <laughs> yeah. And I say, Yom, it really it really hurts. Can you please step out? And come on, don't be such a pussy. Yeah. <laughs> Do come on, don't be do, why are you being so difficult? And when you finally push Yom away, then you're violent. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this I'm this is why I'm so skeptic about discussion yeah. we are not having a discussion yeah. we are ignoring something when 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 you when you make these choices in going into archives yeah and and arranging them because the second one voices is sort of a mini uh is a mini sort of uh history yeah of what it means in documentary Almost. yeah yeah Quasi. Uh, do you, do you, what, what, why the choice for archives? Can I, can I ask you that? Yeah, of course, of course. Why archives? Of course, why archives? Um, and which archives as well? I'm curious. Where did yeah, of you course. This? Yeah. this is um, archives from Bild and Geluid. Okay. And actually what I did was, because normally you have to pay it. Okay. And what I did, I went, it was initially a collaboration between me and a Curaçao uh, documentary maker, Shirley Manuelson. Okay. Uh, she has a film out, by the way. Go see it. Uh, What's it called? Uh, I forgot the name. Mm. Just look at it. <laughs> look for Cheryl Lee It's so all over. Um, and uh, she was doing a master artistic research that I also did. Okay. And so we went to, to the Building Geluid archives and we were actually looking for that demonstration here in The Hague on the 1st of June of 69. Okay. And then uh, we just found, oh, by the way, very interesting in archives. When you're going to research in archives, don't look for race. You're not going to find it. Okay. Okay. Don't look for conflict in race. You're not going to find any tag with it. You have to look for like very general stuff like Down Hills, okay. Curaçao, The A, Demonstration, if you're lucky. But don't look for race. You won't find anything. Um, and so we, we found this footage, I have in total five, seven hours something, but your question was this, no, your question was actually why archives? Why archives, yes. Well, archives form identity, okay. just like your memory forms your identity, right? Mm -hmm. You recollect some things and you erase some things that are less pleasant, mm -hmm. you put them aside, mm -hmm. and that's exactly the same way that actually archives are structured. Yeah. That we forget some things, we things that are painful, that are not, that we rather don't look at it, we put them away, and things that are, if you see the Facebook account of Building Cloud, and you see the posts that they do, it's everything very nice, most of the things. Mm. So they are building also an imagery, yeah. and building an identity. Archives are strictly linked with our identity, and in my opinion, also with our what it, what may be called a nation identity, yes. the nation yes. state. As you see, the nation state takes a lot of time and effort to put the archives in a secluded place. Okay. You cannot reach it very easily. Yeah. They're put it away, they're stashed, they're labelized. So yeah. 
there's a, a conscious uh, work of building up an identity. That's why archives. Yeah. But so you go into the archives and you rearrange it a little bit. No, I rearrange yeah. it a lot. <laughs> yeah. You do some strong creation. Really? Yeah. Do, you, do you what do you expect? Mm -hmm. do, were you aware of the kind of emotion and the kind of conflict, internal conflict, it could um, bring about for, say, the Dutch uh, re watcher, the Dutch uh, colonial, like with you know, with a colonial history uh, or not, um, say Surinamian or Antillean. Do you did you have a sense of like this might have like a very strong impact? This might be painful, to say the least. Uh, in both ways. Yeah. So yeah, I'm conscious of. Uh, that for you uh, it's almost impossible to see it in once and I'm, I'm also aware how much painful it is for people of color to look at some things and just feel the pain that they feel in everyday life yeah. I am aware of that and I don't want to cause pain but at the same, one, at the same time I do want to put a discourse that's not there yeah. and um, um, it's an attempt, an humble attempt, because I'm, I'm aware I'm an artist and we are here screening with 25 people or so max. And I know that my reach is not big and stuff, but I hope that we at least can make a little bit of a conscious change. Mm. Um, so I'm not that megalomanic that I think I'm going to change Holland in two days mm. or three or my whole life. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but um, it's also putting actually a discourse that's not there. Mm. So there's an omitted discourse that's put aside, and I'm making an effort to put that discourse again there. Yeah. And uh, to put, uh, yeah, that. Well, I think, because I wanted, to, I wanted to talk to you about this, because I remember when I was watching this myself, I thought, okay, uh, this is really painful. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of images that are circulated of, of black pain, of black yeah. trauma, of black of people, yeah. black people being vi done violence to. And it has become sort of like a Twitter or a Facebook kind of commodity, you know? And, and I used to engage that a lot. I used to share a lot of these images, mm -hmm. trying to be like, to show the world what's happening. Until I started thinking about like, you know, maybe, and I know how, per, how perverse this may sound, but at some point I started being suspicious of whether it's not being consumed. Whether violence upon black bodies is not something that becomes sort of a, a, a consumptive, like, Product. I mean, we see it in yeah. movies. You know, why yeah. is it that in movies the first person who dies is a black person, for example? You know, yeah. um, I mean, I could go on. Like the rape of black women in 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 the in the how many it's a slave movie? You know, like, yeah. um, and I started being doubtful, and I started going like, I will not share things that actually sort of um, make it possible for people to consume black pain. But this archive stuff, and I was I was I was I, it took me a couple of days because I was first like. Maybe this is what's happening again. But then I was thinking about how many of the communities, especially, for example, African communities, where the only source of, um, of a history are our parents' stories, right? And the only source of, like, sort of, of this archiving are oral stories. There's, mm -hmm. It's not in our school books. It's not, I mean, I'm from Burundi, and it's not in our school books in Burundi because the curriculum is set by the Belgians still yeah. till today, you know? Yeah. Um, it's not on television. You know, it's not, you know, the stories of, for example, Lumumba, it's like activists were still trying to keep that up, the, the knowledge of what happened to Lumumba, right? Yeah. And I remember I was like, I'm actually, I was watching and I was like, I'm grateful that I can have some sense of recognition that what happens to me now in, in Gouda isn't something new. That people have told me, parents have told me, grandparents have told me, this is what happens as a black person mm -hmm. if you decide to take use of your political right to demonstrate. This is what happened. This is what white people would do. And it's so, you know, it then it happens to you, and then you talk to people, and you're gaslighted. They're like, well, that's not, no. Okay, you know, so there was a, there was, you know, there was an anti-terrorism uh, befell, you know, like, uh, or, there's always something, right? But what was happening then in 1969? What was happening before that in 1920? What was happening? There's always this violence upon black bodies. So, I just was thinking about that, and I wanted to share that with you here today. That I think it's important that you do this work because we do need, we do need these stories told, and they're 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 erased, right? They're in archives that are difficult <laughs> to sort of un, you know sort of uncategorize and find your stuff, and all we have left, uh, or all we get, is the stories of our parents. But those stories are also made 
sort of like ridiculous by this kind of this counter archiving, this historical mm -hmm. sort of oration, these historians that do this, right? So mm -hmm. I just wanted to tell you that it's important that you keep going. Thank you. I really think so. Thank you. It's re uh, I'm very aware that uh, I'm, I'm very aware of the commercialization of pain on colored bodies. Mm -hmm. I'm very aware of it, and it, it, it troubled me during the, the editing as well, but I'm glad you said this to yeah. me, so <laughs> I'm glad that I, I... I don't speak for all black people, by the way, I don't know no, what I'm, all I'm, the others think. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not assuming that, okay. I'm not assuming that. <laughs> Uh, I know you, I don't know all black people. <laughs> uh, so I'm happy to, uh, to hear that. I, I, I do want to mention, although oral tradition of uh, uh, passing on history is by, by the West not seen as a very strong way of producing and transmitting knowledge, mm -hmm. I do think it's one of very uh, underestimated ways of transmitting knowledge. Yeah. I would love to do something about oral traditions, by the way. Yeah. Uh, because I think that's very important for every community. Yeah. I want to talk to you about uh, you, in your first work, you're also going into those archives and you're making it personal. What do you do with the discomfort and the pain? What do you do? How do you deal with it? Can I ask you about that? Of course. Okay. Um, it was really a tough moment, mm -hmm. psychologically. Mm -hmm. uh, it was enormously tough. I, I was fortunate that I was in therapy already. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I don't know if I could uh, hold, the, hold it all. And uh, it was already difficult enough to go through, because actually I was also reliving it. Mm -hmm. I was constructing it, but I was also reliving a lot of trauma, so I was re-experiencing all the pain again. And um, I didn't have a very nice youth, and uh, it's it, it was a way of dealing with it, but it was not the easiest way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. So it was psychologically quite and emotionally very severe, yeah. very severe. Uh, I'm glad I came out of it quite the same, yeah. <clears throat> quite. I think it's interesting that you're talking about what. Uh, colonial violence has done to not only, because in the movie you're very, very descriptive mm -hmm. of the kind of violence. I mean, uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't pull any punches for anyone. But I think it's really interesting that you put it in the context of the kind of harm that is caused in your family into this generation, this lost generation, right, that you described. And I'm very interested in sort of these, this sort of analysis of what does white supremacy, what does colonial sort of legacy and violence, that cultural archive that we don't talk about, mm -hmm. that, that Gloria Becker really, what does it do? Um, Sorry, I have to drink. Yeah, of course. <coughs> that sounds like... <laughs> no, I, I have to. We have an NA meeting after? No. <laughs> <laughs> do we? Sorry, that's a bad do joke. <laughs> I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going. No, no. But um, what does it do to the to the mind to the the psyche the the um, the I guess emotional integrity of the the beneficiary of the white supremacist system. But uh, you know, it, it's very funny that you mentioned this because it's uh, my family is a crazy crazy house. Eh? Mm -hmm. So in the same house lived my grandfather, mm -hmm. who was uh, the how do you call that uh, facility manager of the so-called par parliament of Salazar. The, the dictator, okay? He was married with this niece who came from Mozambique, mm -hmm. and my father was a revolutionary on the left and right wing. Okay. <laughs> so, and you have this melting pot mm -hmm. in the same house. And uh, so it's to, to give a little bit of an idea that the things are really complex yeah. in my family. Yeah. I'm not saying that I need therapy, but. <laughs> just I had that. Just a beer. Just I a had beer. that. Just more beer. But I'm curious. I'm curious because I, I would like because I think mm. about that. I think about what does it do. Yeah. Um, what does it do to the to 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 white people trapped in whiteness? Yeah. What does it do to the to the sort of the beneficiary of the imperial in the in the Dutch imp, imp, empire? Mm. 
-hmm. there's something I'm sure it cannot be free of trauma it cannot be free of pain no this constellation no these power relationships are corruptive and that means something right yeah have you ever thought about that like a, because you're an activist mm -hmm. How, oh, come on look at your work and every time I go with you and I need yeah. to fight it's great because <laughs> you help it's really great <laughs> And I wonder, how do you go from a place of, of from where you, from that history of family, mm -hmm. to what you do now? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? What I'm asking? Uh, not completely, but I I, talk I, about I, how do you go away from a place of shame to responsibility, perhaps? Uh -huh. How do you go? How do you move beyond the, the you know? Yeah. yeah. How how do I come uh, uh, the son of a murderer trying to defend uh, a just cause? Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Could you give it in ten steps for the white people? <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 Uh, no. Um, it's not easy to. Uh, can I go back to one thing that you said yeah. first, and then I'll come to yeah. this back? You said, how come? How is it possible? Uh, wh what does it help happen in the psyche? Yeah. I believe in that there's something very important going on, especially when you put on some, some types of, of discourse that go uh, against white privilege, whiteness, uh, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. And that's cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a problem in your mind when <laughs> when the reality that you perceive doesn't match the reality that it is. Mm -hmm. And what you see in psychological terms, because I worked 10 years in the, in the psychiatry, is that uh, you get this defense mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And then you get things as uh, aggression. Mm -hmm. You get things as pushing away. Mm -hmm. You get things as uh, humiliating. Mm -hmm. That's what you get. But it's uh, actually an inner personal dissonance between the cognition that you have of your own reality, the way you perceive your own reality, and when someone confronts you with the reality as it is. Then things get psychologically troubling. So, that. But uh, your second question was actually, how do you go from being the son of a murderer to trying to do something good. Karma? To, un to undo some of this. this is because it's, yeah. it's obviously very decolonial what your work is, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe th uh, that I don't want the pain that I experience. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't want other people to experience. Yeah. I think that bring it down to zero, I think, to ground level, I think that that's it. Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to experience more pain than uh, and I'm not saying I'm a, I've experienced all the pain, and I'm not saying that I'm a victim, enormous victim. Oh God, I'm Jesus uh, on the on the cross. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I've noticed in my personal life how white supremacy, colonialism, inflicts direct pain on people, and I want to stop it. And that's what I'm. I wish for every one of you, black, white. I don't care that you don't have to experience or to endure any more pain because of that. I'm realistic. It's not, I'm not doing work that's going to affect that significantly. Yeah. I'm not stupid. I don't know. I don't know. But I would like uh, that, that pain wouldn't be experienced again. You, you come to the Netherlands yeah. and you're in a racialized position in the Netherlands. Yeah, true. Yeah. In Portugal, I'm white, huh? Yeah. And I think that that's interesting. <laughs> I want to talk to you about that. Yeah. Oh, don't cry. <laughs> my friend. My friend, my friend. Don't cry. I know. I'm going to give you a hug after this. Um, can give a hug now. I now can I go give a hug? <laughs> oh, really. Give for the two of us. I knew you were going to start crying. I knew it. <laughs> um, you're racialized in the Netherlands. Yeah. And... And that's, I think it's really interesting because yeah. I've, I've sat with you and you've told me, for example, I, we were in a conversation and I remember you said, at my work, I'm not allowed to talk about race. Yeah. You, yeah. you work in mental health. Yeah. 
I, as a person of color, I know how much of the mental health issues that we develop, that we struggle through, that we, that we, that we conquer, that we, that we survive, have to do with our racialized position as black people in this country. Yeah. But at your work, working directly with, 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 in mental health, you're not allowed to talk about race. Yeah. So I think that's interesting because your position of racialization informs the knowledge that you have. Your position of, as an activist, and that history that you have of being sort of at the beneficiary of sort of imperial sort of structure in, 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 in Portuguese, or Portugal, have created a sense of responsibility, which I, I feel very strongly with you. But here you're racialized, but also you get to experience the violence mm -hmm. of that, of that dis dissonance, right? Of that mental, of like getting it shut down. Like, don't talk about this is not real. In the Netherlands, this is not an issue. Doesn't but, exist. Yeah. That not talking about, can you talk a little bit more about this sort of, where you end up at your work, not allowed to talk about race? I used to be very vocal. Oh, by the way, I mean, I don't know. Is your is your boss person watching this? No. Okay. <laughs> Talk about no. And I'm I'm quitting my job at the end of of this okay. month, so I'm unemployed. So if anybody knows anything, yes. Um, uh, I was uh, I was uh, very vocal about it. Uh, okay. Indeed, uh, in Portugal I'm white. But when I, as soon as I came here, I was not white anymore. And for me, it was like, what the fuck happened here? Mm -hmm. Uh, what is it? And um, so I started experiencing things uh, very differently. And I, it took me about, I think there, in the first years I was like the perfect alochtone, you know, the guy that's trying to learn the language, that was trying to fit in, going We've all to, been there. Well, we, <laughs> we were all trying. We were all trying. Okay. Not alone. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and at a certain moment, the, the thing got... I'm going to ex ex explain to you where was the moment that I really... I couldn't go back. Mm. So I, I wanted to integrate, I wanted to be with people, and I went... I don't, pl I don't play soccer that well, but I went to this uh, team that was in Campo, where I was living first. And I went to this team, low team, of course, beer drinkers and smokers, very nice for me. <laughs> and we went, and we, we, I had a blast with those guys, who were really amazing guys. And we have a game in Veinendal. And uh, I played uh, forward on that game. And I was uh, playing that game, and the whole game, there was this guy nagging me, uh, the whole guy coming in my bag. Cut Marokan, Hana Haj. And this, this like, but I'm not joking, this like uh, 70 minutes of the game, I was so enraged, I scored three goals or something. <laughs> I, I really, I'm awful at football. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really not good, but I was so enraged. I, the ball had to get in. Uh, I scored three times, and at, at the last five minutes, I was so angry. Uh, I turned around and I said, Hi, Miguel Pesos Portuguese. And the guy takes the hand off, looks at me and says, It's not about your nationality. Yeah. That was a point of no return for me. From that point on, I knew why, how I was perceived. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, I had to make an issue out of it. Mm -hmm. So I started making an issue, and indeed in my work, then I did a lot of stuff and so, and I started working at my work, and I was also vocal about things like black, like Schwarte Piet, like other things like racism on the labor market, because mm. yes, we have a problem on the labor market. Mm. Like a difference of four times more is a problem in the labor market. Mm. It's just, and if you don't believe me, go look at CBS, they have the statistics for you. Um, but m my boss started not liking that. Mm. So at a certain moment she said to me, well, Miguel, I'd rather have that you don't talk about this here. But to go further, because I heard the story of somebody else, I don't want to mention names, mm. but there was this uh, black woman activist uh, who lives uh, in the Netherlands who was really severely depressed because she was working very much in the anti-racist uh, movement and she got so many microaggressions and aggressions that she, she was getting so depressed she went to therapy. Yeah. So when she got to therapy, the therapist said to her, um, no, you're yeah. seeing things, you're paranoid. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're paranoid. Actually, I'm gonna diagnose you. You're just paranoid. Yeah. There's, there's no problem here. You're just paranoid. <coughs> and this is, this is actually a sign on how it goes often. Mm. If it's now me or my work, there's this normalization of racism mm. as if it doesn't exist. Yeah. And yeah, so I think, oh, well, thank you for that. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting because I've, I've, I've dealt with, with many therapists. I've been through a bunch. Yes, I'm not easy. <laughs> and I tell them always in the beginning, I'm like, uh, this is cute, but I'm not going to be easy on you, right? And I don't take for granted what they have got to say. And one of the first things I do is check whether they will acknowledge that I know what I'm talking about, that I actually know what my life looks like, especially if they're white. I check whether they will acknowledge that if there is anyone that knows what, what racism looks like or what it feels like and what it does to me, that I know about it, if they don't, if they do things like, but are you sure that that's what they meant? Or are you sure that, I mean, that's a form of emotional and psychological abuse called gaslighting, right? Mm -hmm. It is minimizing or questioning the kind of trauma that somebody, or pain that someone, or violence that someone is, is undergoing. Yeah. And I cannot have my therapist gaslight me. Cannot have that, because then I'm not on the path of healing. I'm not on the path of processing. The current therapist that I have, like, she, she did that in the beginning, and then I was like, I can't work with you. She was like, uh, okay, can we try again? I was like, sure. She was like, what is it that you need from me? And I was able to design with her sort of like the, the parameters of the mm -hmm. kind of therapy that we're gonna do. And, and it was very like, because she was also starting to say like, oh, it looks like you have some paranoid and sort of, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and but it is everywhere. I'm a bitch, it's everywhere. It's <laughs> everywhere. It's not like it's not everywhere, it's yeah. just everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that I think is really important in that relationship with your therapist and you know, like to just be able to be safe. Mm -hmm. Like your experience is, is actually acknowledged, you know? So when you said that, when we were in that meeting and you said, my, my, in my work I'm not allowed to say that, like, I was like, fuck, this is exactly why so many of the activists that I do know, yeah. and so many of the black people are online, right? in forums, in groups, like oftentimes secret group, people go like, I need a therapist. Does anybody know a therapist of color? Does anybody know a queer therapist, you know? Mm -hmm. Does anybody know a mm -hmm. woman therapist? And, mm -hmm. like, and I say, wow, you know, the, were you wearing that? You know, like, <laughs> and this happens, this violence within mental health, this gaslighting of patients of color who are queer, is, anyways, I wanted to say that because I remember so clear when you said that, like, I, we were having another meeting, but in my heart, I was like, I, yeah, I, I, it resonated with me, with me very Yeah, strongly. I can imagine. Yeah. For me, it was very difficult as well to go through therapy. In the first, it was very similar with you. Mm -hmm. I also, in the first instance, uh, my therapist also rejected, yeah. and, and she's Indonesian. Yeah. <laughs> and she first, first rejected the, the idea. But as news came out and she became also more aware, I also noticed a change within her. But what I've learned from her as well, actually, she told me this once, is the fact that there's a, a, an arena and there's a bull in it, doesn't mean that I get to, get to, to go jump and fight the bull every time. No? <laughs> what? <laughs> no, no, I really, really. Up, I don't know where you're you sometimes, from. <laughs> you sometimes just pull back, okay. and just sometimes you pull back and see the bull going around, and when it's time... I mean, that, that's, I think for me that's difficult, because I, I have understand. found... I, yeah, I understand. Because I have found a kind of healing in struggle. Yeah. In fighting back, yeah. I have found that there is dignity mm -hmm. that there is and that's something that's hard to come by in a, in a system in which you're marginalized racially like, like you said humiliation is one of the things that one of the, uh, the the tools one of the one of the and and to find your dignity i to be in a place of struggle like today my voice is gone but i felt so good on the streets claiming and yelling at all these white yeah. people passing by when like black lives we were literally in a in a, in a whole row of, of, of people we're in an anti-racism march yeah. where yelling Black Lives Matter was something that the other white participants did not like. Mm -hmm. Why are they in a fucking yeah. anti-racism yeah. march if they cannot say the words Black Lives Matter? Then you're in the wrong... But that's a different thing. No, 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 no. I, think, I think this is very important but, but because I do my work. Listen, I don't get paid for... I, 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 it's not like I live for my work. No. 
that's the, that's the fire that keeps me going. Yeah. You know, in the work, in the yeah. You know, otherwise, I would quit. Yeah. I would be stopped already ages ago. It's yeah. not like I'm super successful and having all the funds of the world. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm bullshit. I work on my laptop, you know, in my house, very small apartment and trying to, to make things, you yeah. know, this is what I do. That's my way of fighting, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I understand fully that inner strength that you get from rage, yeah. one may say. But to come back to, to it, it, I think there's many times people understand racism, that word, for example. Mm -hmm. And they think, yeah... Sorry, do I need to move it? You want to stop? No, no, I'm just checking the time because I could keep doing this for like three hours, by the way. So Me too. <laughs> I, have to, I don't know. Really I'm You're free it. to leave. <laughs> <laughs> we just keep on talking. Uh, uh, where was it? <laughs> about like... We're yeah, about racism. Like, yeah. For, uh, some people, uh, uh, some people, white people, yeah. most white people, think of, uh, of racism... Oh, oh, so, sorry. Um, uh, think uh, think of racism as an act, yeah. 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 but racism is not an act; it's a system. Yeah. And this is where we keep on talking two languages. Mm -hmm. But I'm not being racist. I'm not racist. My group is not racist. My people are not racist. Mm. But if you live in a system that is racist, mm. that cultivates white supremacy, yeah. that cultivates white privilege. You can say that you're not pre not racist, but I don't fucking care. Yeah. I don't care because I'm fighting the system. Not I'm not fighting you. You as a person, it's insignificant. Yeah. Insignificant. It's important. Is the whole. Yeah. And that's what many people don't get, because when we invoice pain, something happened to us, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, mm -hmm. somebody did an action to us that was racist. Mm -hmm. And we complain about it. And so the focus goes on there. Yeah. While I believe, at least me, I'm also angry and I also want to invent and voice my pain at that moment. Yeah. But I would be happy if it doesn't happen again and again and again. Yeah. And that's not going to stop if one person stops. Yeah. That's going to stop when the system stops. Yeah. 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 Whew, yes, that day you brought it to the system. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going all the way. Uh, Systems. I think so. Now and then, I'm asked by organizations to come and talk to them and do a workshop on how they can become more diverse. Mm -hmm. And I have this thing I always like to say in the beginning, just to make sure that they realize that they're not. This is not going to be a fun ride. They paid me yeah. money, and they're not going to like this. <laughs> <laughs> I tell them always, if you, if your company is basically white, or your organization, or your little vereniging or your little, uh, your political party, or your, um, uh, I don't know, your neighborhood, your school. If it's white, you are living in a racist situation, like it's a racist outcome. The intentions don't really matter at that point. Because the str if the system is working properly, if it's working like without any conflicts, it creates racist outcomes. Yeah. No one needs to intend anything for it to end up racist. So, if you look around you and you have a white life in a white house, in, you know, in a white uh, school, white job and everything, and it's all nice and pristinely white, your intentions don't matter. You're participating in a racist system or racist organization or racist neighborhood. The only way that you can undo this racism is by fighting the structural, like sort of built-in mechanisms that create these outcomes. Yeah. And exactly. that's not by intentions. Exactly. Having intentions means nothing. Exactly. I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning. Well, there are people who wake up in the morning. Yeah, there, are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are a couple. There are a couple. I'm going, back, I'm going to go do some racist ass shit today. Yeah. They exist. They exist. Yeah. But most people go about their day and yeah. they are pre they're benefiting from a system. And even that system of, benef of benefit, they don't even see it. Yeah. That's most of the time they don't. No, when we talk about white privilege, it's something that is invisible to them. It's yeah. just. Doesn't make sense. my day. I don't know what about. Yeah. The police didn't like look at me angry and shit. That's normal. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, but the experience on the other side is where you can see them. Because yeah. you're outside, you're under the, under the boot, mm -hmm. and you can actually see it. Yeah. So the most knowledgeable about the system is the people who are excluded from the system. Exactly. But they're the ones whose ideas and whose insight 
and whose perspective and whose knowledge is considered the least relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because these people are going, I have intentions though. <laughs> but I never intended to say this and I was supposed to be. And they, they, they don't understand even that the fact that my voice, my insights, are less relevant, that it doesn't come in as loudly, as clearly to them. The fact that they can add commas and buts and ifs and what if, what, what if and maybe it's something else. The fact that they can do that, that that's a position of power. It's a position of privilege, right? They can actually question this. They can, you can even question the, the color. Yeah. I don't see color. Yes, yes. That's a, a very nice thing. Yes. Especially people who also would then say, like an hour or two later, a couple of drinks further, be like, well, you know, they turn on the lights, you can't see you. I'm pretty sure you see <coughs> my color. <laughs> But anyways, but I think I think uh, uh, I think that's really good to talk about these, these these systems and how structural they are, and how if you do nothing, you will end up like ha reproducing a racist result. Don't you think that it has something to do with the fact that we uh, we went from the colonial to now without breaking anything? But we, I, I come from Burundi. The colonial hasn't stopped. That's what I mean. It hasn't stopped at all. It's come in different forms. It's come in different shapes, in different suits mostly, you know? It was first priests and sort of khaki wearing, weird, I don't know why they decided that was African, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> like this linen and I don't know, people coming up with weird. <laughs> but now they wear business suits. They're working for the World Bank. They, they are NGO, they like the directors. They, they know, all of these people know much better what's good for my people than mm -hmm. we do, right? But, I, but, but true? But I was referencing actually to these structures. So we yeah, went. There has been no. That's why. That's why I wanted. To, this was the first time I could name uh, a film uh, evening yeah. of mine, and I could give it a title. Okay. <laughs> yeah, most of the Everything time people already have titles. Everything right? is possible at Olava Talks. Right. Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I wanted to, to talk about this. Uh, no such thing as postcolonial. Yeah. I do not believe in that bullshit. It's not over. No. I believe we went from a moment that we didn't have, that we, that the West had colonies, to a moment where the West doesn't have colonies, but that doesn't change the system. No. no. So if the system is the same, there's no such thing as post-colonial. And, uh, and that's, I think, uh, the reason why we keep on seeing the same things over and over again. Yeah. For example, unemployment uh, uh, um, numbers of 2014. 6% uh, is white, male. 19% is Moroccan. 19.3% is Turkish. Uh, I believe 18.7% is Antillian. If you have a difference of four times more, you can tell me whatever you want. You can talk about education, you can talk about whatever, you can talk about not dominating the language, but you have a structural problem. If you're not going to work on that problem, I don't want to hear you. It's that simple. I don't want to hear you. Want to wanna talk about solutions? We're going to talk about solutions. Are you going to deny we have a problem? I'm not in the room anymore. I'm yeah. going to go out. Yeah. I'm out. I'm out. I'm not even going to discuss with you. I'm not going to lose my time with you. Yeah. Yeah. This is the arrogance of a Portuguese arrogance. Yeah. 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 Talking about. I've seen it in action. It is a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like in the little WhatsApp group with him and then he's gone. Like, oh, what? Like, only somebody said hello. No. I'm just, and I wasn't even, I remember that I was even afraid to call you. I was like, can I call and ask what? And I call and Because I was like, maybe I should have understood what happened. <laughs> Anyways, but I think it's really interesting about how we go, uh, solutions. Eh? And yeah. what is it, and this is about local politics as well, because we're both on the half suspect yeah. list. And I think it would be interesting to connect to, to the solutions. And um, I'm not going to give an expose of everything that the half suspect believes in. But what I think is really interesting in all these debates that I've been to, and you've, you've, been, you've been as well, is this constant emphasis on the person that is being discriminated? Like yeah. they yeah. need to have like yeah. uh, like some, some like trainings, 
they, you know, when we talk about kids, like, um, so in the Netherlands, you have this, this situation. I mean, you all know the Dutch league, the Dutch educational system, right? These sort of tiers, you know, that that allow you to go to university or to go to um, to go to uh, uh, higher education or go to like uh, applied uh, sciences and all. So you have all these levels bef to get into high school, and there is this test that is administered to decide which level you go go on. Teachers, however, can give an advice, can give like sort of like okay, we don't think. I mean, the test says this kid is here, but we know that this kid can do more. I can go here, right? And where you go will, de will really determine for like a large part the rest of your life, right? Yeah. It will determine what kind of positive, it depends what kind of income you will, will ever have in your life. It will determine basically your social economic sort of stand in society most of the time. Anyways, but we find that when people, kids of color, and with poor kids as well, but kids of, and that's difficult, it's difficult to know how many of the kids that are poor are also of color? Mm -hmm. Because we do yeah. not calculate, mm -hmm. we do not ask race, mm -hmm. because in the Netherlands we've decided that race is not a, an issue. Mm -hmm. So when we try to figure out how many of these kids have good grades, equal grades to their white counterparts or rich counterparts, are actually given advice by their teacher that is lower, it is. You get a very high grade. Does the same with another Dutch kid, white kid. And your teacher says, but this kid cannot handle it. And they're consistently, like at the university, about like 70% of all the kids of color that I was in university with, they went from the lowest levels all the way up to university, which means you have like four to five years, takes you longer yeah. to have the same degree yeah. as your white counterparts. That is like, it's, 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 it's ridiculous, right? And I'm sitting in these debates, and in this city, specifically in this city, it's gotten worse. In fact, we're talking about, in, in the last report, it said that about half a grade, people, kids are being advised about half a grade even lower than what they can, what the tests are showing, right? The tests themselves are problematic, by the way, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, mm -hmm. they have the same grades, but because of their skin color, because of their socioeconomic, their parents' socioeconomic situation, they're being downgraded. And no one talks about the teachers. No. All these parties are all talking about, you know what the kids need more? They need extra school. You know what they need? They need uh, extra, uh, uh, extra uh, language. language classes. Or their parents need language classes. I mean, everything, all kinds of ideas about kids that are having the same grades as their white counterparts. But no one is talking about the teachers. Yeah. Nobody's talking about the system. Nobody's talking about the system. Exactly. There's no such thing as post-colonial. I think we're done here. <laughs> I think we made our point. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. For thank you. This. I really love that you took the time to do this with me and that you uh, that you showed your work. Um, is there any other really awesome project that you're doing? This awesome project that you're doing. <laughs> do you want to put? Your hand here. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so go on. Tell us a little bit. Tip of a tip, tip, just a tip of the. If I'm able to uh, have uh, the means to do it, I would love to do this project with Egbert Patina mm -hmm. and other people. Mm -hmm. It's a project about an uh, uh, um, an enslaved person that uh, escaped Curaçao in 1700. Mm -hmm. uh, 1737, and he was declared free in Amsterdam for two times, mm -hmm. as slavery was not allowed in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands officially. He was chased by his owner in the Netherlands, and uh, there was this uh, high court case here at the, in the Hague at the Ograd. Mm -hmm where now the Tweede Kamer is. And uh, it was, they have the two sessions. Uh, he was not allowed to speak, of course, because black people were not allowed to speak Dutch. Um, they were allowed to speak in court. They were not allowed. Uh, no, it, it was like, that, yeah. It, it, black it's people, compl complicated. Okay, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. and um, the Ograd here decided that he was, um, and this is very painful, I'm sorry. Um, decided to send him back to Curaçao and to his owner because he was the thing stolen and the thief himself. 
So that is the argument. And the argument is therefore... Don't, don't, don't tell more. We have to sit down. Don't, don't say more. No, no, you got to keep it in. I did the spoiler already. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what else? But another great archive, piece of archive, because you found it in the archive. Actually, I was, uh, I was attended by Herbert Martina to this specific court case, and then I got in contact with yeah. the National Archives. Yeah. I'm just saying, there's a lot to uncover. Thank you all very much. I think we can stop the live stream. I'm going to talk to you for a second and see if you feel like I take some questions. Maybe you can all have a drink or something. I know I want to have a drink, and then we can see, right? Then you can ask questions yeah? now. Yeah, Let's of course, stop no the problem. Live stream.